wonderful, merciful Savior. Father, Lord, only you can deliver this message through me to each and every one of us. Lord, I humble myself. I empty myself and ask that you take full control of all my faculties, of my whole entire being from within to without. So as your words leave my lips, that my life will be transformed. And that those that are hearing will also be transformed. Drive all evil forces out of our homes. Steady this medium so that your, so that your will be accomplished today. This is all prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I want us to look at the topic, surrendered. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to play the opening hymn, but I know this is a well-known hymn to all of us. The hymn entitled, I Surrendered All. It's about four verses. And in the song, we are making a declaration that all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I truly give. Do we really? Worldly pleasures, all forsaken, have we? Make me wholly thine. Is this our most urgent and number one desire? Well, I have come to the realization that once we are practicing sin, then self will always be the motivating factor of the things we do. Christ is speaking a people who are willing to be totally surrendered to him. So why the sermon entitled Surrendered? Well, surrendered can mean give up, relinquish, renounce, or to give up, or to hand over, forsaking, parting with. We have heard it many times before, that Christ wants us to give him full control of our lives. It is easier said than done. But we are not without hope. Our assurance, without hope, or assurance of victory. We at times, have cherished sins that we are struggling with or have not surrendered to God. Some of us have idols in our lives that are preventing the full working of the Holy Spirit and the transformation of our character and the renewing of our minds to that of Christ. Understand that failure to surrender or relinquish a life of sin or a sinful life will result in us for feeding our opportunity to enter the God's kingdom. God has promised in his word that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those said sins and to cleanse us, not from some, but all unrighteousness, as quoted in 1 John 1 verse 9. The truth is, some things are harder to get rid of. We love doing them. Whether it be fornication, gossip, lies, adultery, sexual immorality, pride, the list goes on and on. Romans chapter 7. Verse 15 to 17 talks about the things I ought to do. I do them not, but the things I hate that I do. We naturally gravitate to sin by our nature. But Christ has not only paid for our sins, but has freed us from a life of sin. In the scripture reading read by Master Larone earlier, 
Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But what? Our iniquities have separated us from God, and our sins have hidden his praise from us so that he will not hear. Brethren, the problem is not God. The problem is us. We are not too far off the coming of Christ, and we must be prepared to live a life without sin now. Not tomorrow, not next week, but now. Whilst we are preparing for Jesus' glorious appearing, I want us to realize that we must totally and absolutely surrender to Christ and put away all sin out of our lives. This is a battle of allowing self to die, surrendering our will and lives to Christ. This is a fierce battle and victory is guaranteed to those that will allow Christ to work in and through them. In Paul's letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, who the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Paul is encouraging Timothy, declares that the battle to surrender self to God can be won, and that there is a reward for the overcomer. Now, this letter was for Timothy, but Paul is speaking to you and, and to I, because he says, and not only me, but unto them. Who are them? All of us. I don't know about you, but I am tired of making excuses. You may have heard others say the same excuses. Well, God is working on me. God is not done with me yet. I am not Jesus and so on. Why do we make excuses? And who are we blaming? Rather than taking full responsibility. Let us go back to the beginning. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, from verse 1, it reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God has made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, and God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, be careful what you see, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she looked, she took, sorry, of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Then God came down 
And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I've heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said on, and God said to him, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I've commanded thee that thou should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What it is that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Interesting, isn't it? So the serpent deceived Eve. Eve gave the fruit to Adam. He ate it. But look how it's now all God's fault. Starting with Adam. Adam replied, the woman whom thou gavest to me. So he's saying to God, if you didn't give me Eve, I would not have eaten that fruit from the tree. Eve blamed the serpent. You see, they both made excuses for their disobedience. Brethren, today, I hope, I pray that we will not make excuses, but go to God, seeking forgiveness in fervent and persistent prayer and fasting for the victory over sin in our lives. I am not saying that we won't make mistakes. What I am saying is let us not make any excuse. Let us recognize that we have sinned and with a contrite heart and a spirit seek forgiveness for strength to leave those sins with Christ and turn away and claim the promises in faith that we are cleansed by God's grace and go and sin no more. There are times that we feel we have it all together. We are praying. We are serving. We are witnessing. But truth be told, we are double dealing. We are guilty of double dealing when we retain privately those evil practices we have renounced in public. Iniquity is iniquity to God, whether done in secret or openly. We are guilty of double dealing when we practice partially the evils we have renounced as a whole. You see, brothers and sisters, when we accepted Christ, we made a profession of faith just before our baptism. We took vows. That's how we double deed, when we break those vows that we made to our Lord and Savior. Do you know that sin towards the concept of what justice and reconciliation is? In the first 12 verses of John chapter 8, a very well-known story. The story of the woman caught in adultery. You will notice from this story that it's only the woman that was brought. I thought it took two to tango. You will note Jesus' response to the accusers. He who is without sin, let him pass the first stone. They all departed, being convicted by their conscience. Brethren, let us not esteem ourselves above each other, 
But take counsel, found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let us not be so quick to judge those who we may know or think are openly committing sins. Let us not become complacent because we are not addicted to smoking of all its kind, stealing, of lying, of fornicating, committing adultery, gossiping, pride. The list goes on. Let us reflect upon ourselves in light of Christ and his word. Christ is merciful to us. Let us extend our arms of mercy with the intention, like Jesus, to bring restoration of the sinner to the Savior. You will notice in the story of the adulterous woman that Christ has forgiven her and commanded her to go and sin no more. It doesn't mean that there are no consequences to her actions or ours when we sin. I am not saying they shouldn't be disciplined. What I am saying is that the discipline and actions taken must be one that will allow the sinner to be forgiven and reconciled with God. Sometimes, if we are truly honest, we are like the accusers in the story. I want us to recognize that it's hard for us sometimes to see the speck in our own eye. Don't get me wrong. If we know our brother, our sister is committing and practicing sin, we must warn them. We must encourage them to turn back to God. This must be done, however, in sincere love to see our brethren recommitted to Christ. But we must always reflect inward and ask Christ to reveal and show us anything that's in us that's unlike him. Let us go to the book of Isaiah. We are currently studying this quarter in the adult Sabbath school lesson study. You see, to gain victory over sin in our lives, we need a fresh, we need a new vision of God in all his glory. When we look at the book of Isaiah, it's a very interesting book. The meaning of the name Isaiah is that the Lord saves. The central theme of the book is God himself who does all things for his children's sake. Interlink throughout the book is judgment and salvation. Judgment against God's people and other nations. But one of the things I love about this book, Isaiah, is salvation is available to everyone, even those who currently don't believe in God can be part of his family. The prophet, Isaiah, the prophet in chapters 1 to 5, book of Isaiah, 1 to 5, read it in your own time. The prophet Isaiah in chapters 1 to 5 given vision, given word concerning Judah and Jerusalem regarding their sins, idolatry and judgment. But in chapter 6, it's personal. In chapter 6, it's personal. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, the word of the Lord reads, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain covered 
his face with two. With when covered his feet. With when he did fly. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the horse of the dwarf moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because what? I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life cold in his hand which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away and thy sins purged. That's what we need. We need to recognize we have sinned. And we need to recognize that we need to be cleansed. Brethren, can you see Christ? Can you see the Father sitting on his throne in all his glory? Woe unto me. I am undone. I'm a sinner. I am not even worthy to call upon thee. Brethren, some of us have been in this Christian walk for a long time. Some of us has grown up in the faith. And we have read some of these st stories. We have heard the counsel. But I'm saying today, we need a fresh look, a new look at Christ. And when we have a new look at Christ, my prayer is that we will be like Isaiah. That our desire is to be cleansed. You know, sin is like a virus. That's what it is. It's a virus. And I'm telling you, COVID-19, doesn't matter the havoc it has caused, turn the world upside down. It's no way in comparison to what sin has done. You see, Diseases are a result of sin. Unlike diseases and illnesses and all other deformation of our bodies, those of us who are faithful in the end and have washed their robes, who have kept the commandments of God, will have right to the tree of life, as mentioned in Revelation 22, verse 14. But not only that, we will have bodies that will never fail again. You see, brethren, we should not live in fear of illnesses and diseases or even death. Our greatest matter and task at hand is to be totally surrendered to God so that we can have victory over self and sin. Victory over self and sin. I would like to read a quote to us from Ellen White is taken from gospel workers. The subheading is consecration to the work, the warfare against self. It's the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God and being clothed with humility, possessing that love that is pure, peaceable, and easy to be entreated, full of gentleness and good fruit, is not an easy attainment. The soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in knowledge and true holiness. 
the holy life and character of Christ is a faithful example. His confidence in his heavenly father was unlimited. His obedience and submission were unreserved and perfect. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister to others. He came not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. In all things, he submitted himself to him that judgeth righteously. From the lips of the Savior of the world, we heard these words, I can of my own self do nothing. We, of our own self, can't do a thing. Brethren, to get sin out of our lives requires a skillful surgery. It requires a surgeon that is able to remove it and fill us with something else. You see, brethren, sometimes, sometimes we think that we have gotten rid of sin. But what we haven't done is place that emptiness with something else. And because we haven't placed it with something else, then we find ourselves going back into the same old thing over and over again. And brethren, to be honest, sometimes it's even worse than where we started. You see, sin in its various form today have become socially acceptable. Let's be, let's be truthful. It has. It's on the TV, on the, on the advertisement boards, and so on. You might say now that sin is now modern warfare. When one think about modern warfare, it's not just about men with guns going to war, but warfare using drones, bio, and nuclear weapons. Gamers today that love video games, they no longer purchase your standard computer or laptops. They will go for something called Alienware. These are powerful computers and laptops that allows the gamer to run and enjoy the latest game. Today, we have the most advanced weaponry in the spiritual warfare. These weaponries are not new like Alienware, but they are more advanced and has the ability to change and transform our lives and give us victory over self and sin. Our weaponries, our weaponries are the word of God, tried and tested for centuries and has never failed. How shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed of his word. Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. The Holy Spirit, he convicts us and guides us. He comforts us. Prayer, the ability to move the arm of God according to his will. Service, through ministry and witnessing, this allows us to care for others, to seek to bring others into a relationship with Christ through the indwelling and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. This allows us to focus on God and do the things that please him. Angels, they protect us from things seen and unseen as directed by our Heavenly Father. Christ, our Redeemer, our Intercessor, and not forget my brethren, and the Father himself, God himself. Brethren, we have the greatest weaponry that will guarantee us victory. The question is, do you want that victory? 
And are you willing to fight to the end to obtain it? As I mentioned before, Paul did. So did Jacob wrestling, wrestling all night, will not let go until he is blessed. And as a result, he was no longer the deceiver, but his name was changed to Israel. And brethren, you might think I've gone too far. I've done too many bad things. But I can guarantee you, you haven't reached the state of Manasseh in the Bible. After all the evil he had committed, sacrificing his own children, he has won the victory over self. The hymn entitled, Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There is nothing between. What is between your soul and your Savior? My prayer is, my hope is, that there be nothing between you and your Savior. Because our Lord, God wants to save you. All he's doing, all he's working, is to save us to be with him for eternity. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How oh, precious is that flow. That made me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Will you be washed today? Will you be cleansed today? May God bless you, church. And may your desire be to surrender it all to Jesus. So you can be cleansed. You can be filled. And you can be ready for his soon and glorious appearing. Amen.